The Girl Who Chased Away Sorrow The Diary of Sarah Nita, a Navajo Girl New Mexico, 1864 Written by Anne Turner I wonder if she is my mother. At the end of the day, after Uncle and High Jumper return, I look around the compound. Fires are flickering in the dusk. Dogs are barking, goats and sheep are bleating. Now we must keep Silvercoat tied by a rope. Aunt says it is the rule here, and our goats are kept in a ditch Grandfather dug next to our shelter. He is taking no chances that they will be stolen again. As I look around, I notice three women coming out of the adobe buildings where the soldiers live. Grandfather thinks they might be sweeping the soldiers' rooms or cooking their food. Slaves, adds Aunt. Jumping up from the ground, Kaiba and I race toward the women. Does one have my mother's shape? The first woman we catch up to is short and squat, not like my mother at all. She looks weary almost disgusted with herself, as her moccasins scuffed the dirt. The second woman who goes by is lean and thin as a juniper bush. Not my mother. Quickly, I step up to the third woman, whose head is bowed. My mother? I ask softly. Glenba? Her head snaps up as she turns toward me. Mother? I ask again, not sure who is before me. She is much thinner than my mother, though her face is a little like hers. But where once my own mother had a soft and gentle look, this woman's face is hard as flint. Serenita? She whispers. My daughter? We grip each other tightly, crying and shouting, My mother, my daughter, my mother, my daughter! rocking back and forth. Kaiba, who had held back, throws herself at Mother, wrapping her arms around her slight body. It looks as if that evil giant who devoured human beings had bitten chunks out of my mother, leaving a smaller, thinner woman. Oh, my daughters, my daughters, she says over and over like a blessing way chant that will heal us and make us well again. Where is my father? Grandfather leads us over to our fire and makes us sit on a rug. He tells my mother that sister and I were so brave, journeying all the way to Tsei, and that we kept up all the way on the long walk. Grandmother hands her a piece of warm bread while I speak one word. Father? Mother says soon she will take us to him, but that he is not as he was. She does not know if he has some illness, or if he is sick at heart. Grandmother shakes her head, saying that many of our people have died from disease and heartbreak. But I want them to stop talking so I can ask more questions. What of my cousins? What of uncle and aunt? When I finally have a chance to ask, Mother smiles for the first time and says that they escaped from the first fort that the soldiers took us to, going back to the mountains. When Silvercoat darts forward and licks Mother's ankles and hands, she hugs him fiercely. Now we are all together again. The only person we need to complete our circle is Father. But I am afraid to say his name again. We see our Father. With Kaiba on one side and me on the other, Mother walks across the dusty compound. On the way, Kaiba practices her English words the one she's learned from Micah eyes. Sit down. Come here. Hello. How are you? Isn't that good, Serenita? I think she is hoping to impress my father when we find him. But I am too frightened to speak. Suddenly, Mother ducks into a lopsided shelter made from sheets of bark leaning together. Dirt is piled up around the outside to keep the bark from blowing away. A ragged blanket is pulled back from the door. Husband? 
she called softly. I have a wonderful surprise for you. Silence from inside. Kaiba pulls on Mother's hand, wondering if Father is sick. Mother just motions us gently inside, gesturing toward a blanket on the ground. Lying there is a shape that could be my father, but I cannot see his face or hear his voice. Oh, don't let him sound like half a live man, I pray. Father? Kaiba steps forward, the bravest this time. Touching his knee, she tells him that his daughters are here. That we have survived the long march and have come all this way to be with him again. With a groan, he holds out his arms and clasps her to his chest, rocking her back and forth. When he calls our names, when I can hear my father in his words, then I leap forward, clasping his shoulder and burying my face in it. Even then, I cannot speak but just touch him, feeling how his bones jut up under his skin. I am afraid. Suddenly, great coughs rack his body, and he leans forward, gasping for air. Sister and I jump back while Mother runs forward with a bowl of water. Finally, after a terrible time when I thought he would die from coughing, he is able to sip a little water and settle back onto the blanket again. He is too tired to say goodbye. Only his eyelashes flutter when Kaiba and I whisper, Rest, my father. Outside the shelter, I hug Mother so close she cries out. If I hold them both tight enough, if I can get medicine, if I tell stories to chase away sorrow, then Father will not die. But I don't tell her that. I only ask if we should move our sheepskin rugs into their shelter. Her face brightens, the way it did when she saw a lucky yellow bird in a tree by our hogan. She says that there is room for all of us. And when she has to work for the soldiers, we can care for father. Maybe the sight of his daughters will make him well again. We leave grandmother's shelter. Running through the camp, dodging children, goats, and dogs, Kaiba and I reach grandmother's shelter, where they are still sitting around the fire outside, talking. Words tumble out of my mouth about father, his terrible cough, how we are moving to their shelter, and does Grandmother have any herbs to help? With a gentle smile, Sani gathers up our old sheepskins and hands them to Kaiba. These have come a long way, my friend says. Aunt heaps a clean blanket on top and some cooked bread. Grandmother rummages in her leather herb pouch, coming up with a handful of crushed gray leaves. She tells me to brew them in a pot of water until it boils then let it cool off the fire. Father should sip it whenever he is thirsty. Grandfather wishes he could find someone to do a ghostway ceremony to heal father and bring him back into Hozo, harmony with the world. But uncle snaps that that would be impossible. They could not pay the Hetali, the singer, and he would not have the things necessary for the healing way. If I were your father, Aunt says softly, cradling her sleeping baby, I would be healed once I had my two daughters again. I hope you are right, my aunt. I pray you are right. I dream of rescue. That night, I think I will never sleep. Listening to my father's harsh breathing reminds me of living with half a live man. And I curl so close to my sister that she pokes me in the ribs to make me move away. Mother sleeps beside father a clay bowl filled with grandmother's medicine nearby. When he coughs during the night, I hear him sipping the brew and sighing. Through the partly open door blanket, I see moonlight on the ground outside. Some night creature scuttles through a shining path so fast I can't see if it is a rat or something else. Silvercoat howls mournfully outside, and I go outside to hush him. Soldiers tramp back and forth around the edges of the compound, keeping watch. Their long black shadows slip along the ground. They are afraid we will run away. And wouldn't we? 
If we had enough food, if we had our horses back, wouldn't we be gone by morning if we could? Finally, I go inside and sleep just before dawn. In a dream, I have my old horse back and jump onto his back from a boulder, grabbing the rope nose piece. Trotting gently, I make my way through all the broken shelters in this evil fort, coming to my parents' place. Holding out a hand, I help my father onto the horse, and mother climbs in front. Somehow there is room for Kaiba too, and with our dog loping beside us, we canter off. Far away from the earth-colored buildings, far away from the blue soldiers, back to our red land, our hogans, our sheep, and our crops that grow in the hot sun. I think about food for my father. The next day, I decide that we must start healing my father. The first thing is to make the shelter more weatherproof. The winds at night come right through the cracks between the bark pieces, and if rain ever falls, he will be soaked. After mother goes off to clean the soldiers' houses, and after asking permission from a soldier standing guard, Kaiba and I head away from the compound. We do not use words, only point towards some far trees. Then I hear steps running behind me and crouch down, thinking it might be a soldier. But it is High Jumper. He tells me we cannot go outside the fort without him, that it is not safe. There are Comanches beyond the fort and other dangers. He waves his hand. And I wonder if he means what that woman at the river warned us about, that some of the soldiers are cruel to our women. To one side we see the fields. Today is the white people's day of rest, and no one is working. We tramp and tramp through the new green grass, collecting armfuls to feed our goats. Other people are already ahead of us, pulling up grass to put under their babies' bottoms, and looking for food and wood. When we finally reach the trees, there is only one left with any bark on it. All the others have been stripped clean. High Jumper cuts through the bark with a sharp stone, and together we pull off a large piece. Then we trudge the long way home again, happy to have found anything at all. When we reach the compound, we fix the bark over the holes in my mother's shelter, piling dirt over the bottom. Father whispers that everyone else is with the soldiers in the gathering place. There I see grandmother, grandfather, and all the rest seated, watching a thin white man in long black clothing. That's the laundress's man, High Jumper tells me. He says Aunt told him about them, that they are like our medicine men. The white man in black says many long words over us, but there is no corn pollen. No sand paintings or songs. Just words going on and on while the birds fly overhead and the wind sings. He uses the word Jesus a lot. High Jumper says Aunt told him this white man is very powerful. Maybe I will ask this Jesus man to protect my father and make him well. Afterward, we go back with Grandmother and Grandfather. He tells us that we should have nothing to do with the laundress's man, or any other person the white people pray to. Our holy people and our songs are meant for us, to heal and strengthen us and keep us walking in the way of beauty. I Dream of Corn That night, Father sleeps a little more quietly. I hope that Grandmother's medicine is working. I dream of our cornfields back home, how we planted the seeds deep in the earth where it was moist, how we watched the first green shoots come out of the earth, how we prayed for rain to nurture the plants, and how we celebrated when the corn tasseled. I wake up knowing that I must find corn for my father. He needs it to get well. He needs it to heal. We find corn in a terrible place. Before the soldiers hand out our food that night, I tell Kaiba that we must search for corn and show it to Micah Eyes, 
that maybe he can help us get some food for father to make him well. We walk between the shelters, asking if anyone has any corn kernels or has seen any. No one has corn, and everyone complains bitterly that they need it. Their stomachs hurt from the white man's food, and there is never enough to fill their bellies. High Jumper joins us, asking what we are looking for. We tell him, and he heads toward the corral where the soldiers have penned our animals. All except our two goats. By the wooden fence, High Jumper points to some soldiers feeding the horses. Corn! I hiss. They are feeding the animals corn! But we could never steal it, High Jumper says. The soldiers would keep us from doing that. As we stand watching, one of the horses cocks his tail and leaves manure by the fence. Kaiba wonders why we are staying here. Shouldn't we be going back for our beef and flour? But I hush her with my hand. I have a terrible idea. Once the soldiers move away to the farther side of the corral, I hurry forward and kneel by the manure. Poking through it with my fingers, I find some undigested corn kernels. Serenita! My sister protests. Wiping it on the grass, I hide it in the skirt of my dress. Then we hurry back, and I don't let myself think about where the corn came from. The white men give us bits of bark. When Mother, Kaiba, and I gather by the wagon holding our beef and flour, Micah Eyes is helping Hotface with the food. They are handing out small, stiff blue shapes to us. They feel like the inside bark of the cedar. Grandfather chews on one edge and jokes that now there is not enough beef, so they are giving us bark instead. Micah Eyes takes Kaiba's arm and says two strange words to us that sound like ration curds. He repeats the words and taps the blue shape. Ration. High Jumper says the word sounds like a dog being sick. In a quiet moment, I go up to Micah Eyes, tugging on his sleeve and holding out the handful of corn kernels. I try to ask him if we can have some, that my father needs it, but he just shakes his head and says the word we all know by now. No. No. Grandmother and some other women are complaining about our food tonight, that the soldiers are giving us all the bad parts of the animals. Aunt holds up a hairy ear from a cow, saying, They think we can eat this? Another woman holds up a hoof, another the guts of the animal. I don't think I can eat tonight. And when we return to my family's shelter, I hold out some corn kernels I've washed hastily. It is not enough to heal my father. I get corn for father. I don't wait for the sun to come. I don't wait for mother to wake to cook us bread on the flat stones outside our shelter. Calling softly to Silvercoat, I hurry toward the corrals before dawn. Stars scatter across the dark sky, and I wonder how something so beautiful that's shone over our Hogan can shine down on these ugly shelters in this terrible place. By the wooden fence, I crouch and look for piles of manure. The edge of the eastern sky begins to lighten, to turn a dull gray. I can see a little better, and poke through some of the horses done from yesterday. A colonel here, five there, ten in another. And just as the red edge of the sun lifts above the land, I rub two handfuls of corn in the wet grass and tuck them in a fold of my dress. A soldier is walking around the compound, his heels making dull thuds on the ground. 
When he sees me, he stops and calls out a command. I duck, trying to run away, but he hurries after me, grabbing my arm. I will not let the corn spill. Silvercoat growls at him, but I cannot hold on to him. It is against the rules to have a dog untied, and I wonder if that's what the soldier will tell me. Head hanging, I wait for the soldier to let me go. With one finger, he lifts up my chin and looks at me. It is a long look. The way those soldiers stared at my aunts by the river. My fingers dig into my legs. Suddenly, I hear a cheery shout. Another man walks up, shouldering a rifle. It is Micah Eyes. I would know his voice anywhere, that low, soft sound. The soldier lets go of my chin, turns, and follows Micah Eyes, away to another part of the compound. I dart home and scuttle into my shelter like smallest one, still clutching my corn. I am not sure what the soldier meant to do. All I know is he was dangerous, and Micah Eyes saved me. My father is grateful. When the others awake, I don't tell Kaiba or mother where I got the corn. I just say that I found some, and it needs washing. Kaiba hurries to the river and brings back a bowl of fresh water for washing the kernels. They are not dry enough to grind, so I throw them into mother's pot and wait for the fire to be ready. Sani comes from grandmother's tent bringing a bowl of warm goat's milk for father. Grandmother thinks this will help him to get better. I mix it with the corn, cooked and cooled slightly, and bring it inside to father. But he protests and says he will sit outside this day. Mother's face brightens, and she walks off with a lighter step to clean the soldiers' houses. Now I know that the medicine and the corn are helping for father stands and limps outside into the sunshine. He says he feels like a turtle getting warm in the sun. Sani smiles at him and says that the Diné food will help him to get well. A sudden sad look crosses her face, and I wonder if she is thinking of her father and brothers, hoping that they got home safely. Now he has medicine, now he has the proper food, now he has his daughters back again. But I promised myself that I would tell him a story to help him get better. When Sani says the ne, I begin to see pictures and hear words inside. Once, I begin, and Kaiba curls up beside me. Once, there was a corn plant named For the Sky because more than anything, it wanted to be the tallest, strongest plant in the cornfield. Oh, how I wish I could touch the blue sky, it said to the corn around it. How tired I am of having my feet in the soil, of never being high enough. It asked the woman who planted it to water its roots every day. It asked the sun to shine down with all its strength. It called to the wind to blow gently so that its stem would be tall and straight. And all happened as it wished. Its stem grew up past the pinyon trees, up above the red mesa, up to the blue sky. But when it reached the sky, the winds were too strong and cold. The sun burned its new leaves and the tender ears of corn growing on its sides. The woman who planted it could not give it enough water for its roots went so deep and so far that they sucked up every drop of moisture in the land. The moon spoke to it one night. It said, You have become too tall. You have reached too far. You are a foolish corn plant. Pray that you will go back to the earth again. That is what you are good for. So the corn plant looked down missing the woman who used to touch its leaves and whisper of growing and harvest, missing the laughter of the children who played nearby, even missing the herd dog who barked at night. 
The quorum prayed for a wind to come, for a drenching rain, and it did. The rain soaked the soil around its roots so that the roots began to pop out of the earth. The wind blew fiercely, bending the plant, toppling its stem until suddenly it crashed to the ground. Now I am home again, thought the corn as it lay dying on the soil. Now my seeds will grow, new corn children. Now my leaves will rot and feed them. I have touched the sky, and it was too much. I pause and sip some water from Mother's gourd. Kaiba and Sani are still beside me. Others have gathered near and sigh when I am done. Father nods in the sun, then opens his eyes suddenly and looks straight at me. He tells me he could hear the voice of Mother's father in mine, that those words have strengthened him. He reminds me that we are from the earth, that the holy people made us, and someday, once again, we will put down roots in our soil and grow strong and tall the way we were meant to be. Uncle Fools the Bilagana When the men return from working in the fields, Uncle smiles mysteriously at us, telling us that he has a surprise. Aunt tells me that he and some of his friends were searching in the trash dumps around the compound and came back, hiding something under their tunics. Uncle disappears inside his shelter for a time, then reappears. Grandmother teases him, but he just smiles again and says we will have plenty of food tonight. We line up together to get our ration, for father, mother, sister, and I always join grandfather's family. I watch uncle go up to hand over his ration card for his portion of beef and flour. Quickly, he hands the food to Slim Woman, then takes off his hat and pulls his hair over his face. We all look the same to the white man, he jokes and gets in line again. Soon he returns with a second portion of food. As we sit around Grandmother's fire, cooking the beef and talking, I look at Starlight. She is not as plump as I would like, but between Aunt and the goat's milk, she seems to be getting enough to eat. At least she is not wailing anymore. High Jumper eats standing, one foot tapping the ground. He still reminds me of a horse about to bolt, and I worry that he might try to run away. But for this moment, I am hopeful. Uncle fooled the Bilagana with his fake ration card and his hair over his face. Any people smart enough to do that can survive the time of the Blue Soldiers. I know it inside, just the way Smallest One knew she had to leave the burrow to survive, just as Scoot now knew she would fly free into the sky one day. Now we are together, my mother and my father beside me, and Kaiba in front. We are not broken, like a rug that has unraveled or been torn to pieces by violence and sorrow. I think that sitting on this earth, in a circle with my people, is like sitting on some great rug woven by the holy people. When I close my eyes, I can see cloud ladders in the corners, the hair of changing women in the middle, and something moving along the sides. I think it is my footsteps, making hollows in the red earth, heading home. The story is in the rug. I put down my pencil. My hand aches from writing, and the shadows are long near the hogan. Grandmother sips some water and listens to the wind rustling, the dried leaves and the branches of our shade house. Grandfather walks out to join us, crouching beside Grandmother the way he used to long ago. Serenita he says, and both grandmother and I look over at him. I mean Serenita, my granddaughter. He smiles and asks if I am finally done writing the story of the long walk. I tell him I am, and ask again what did he think when he ran away after the stolen goats. He smiles and rubs his leg where it is stiff. 
Eye Jumper never did tell us about that time, Grandmother says. But I think it was much harder than he ever said. His toes were injured in the cold, and they've never been the same. She pats his left foot. But what are a few toes when Starlight survived? She wouldn't have if I had not gone after those goats, Grandfather says. I see the look they give each other. It is like a piece of strong yarn binding them together. And I know now that Grandmother's story binds them to me as well. I stretch out my bare feet on the red rug. Beneath me are the patterns Grandmother wove. In the corner are cloud ladders. In the middle is the black hair of Changing Woman. And along the sides are yellow birds and the footsteps of a child. Epilogue Serenita and her family were in Fort Sumner for four long years. Each year, Uncle, High Jumper, and Father went with the rest of the men to plant corn, squash, and pumpkins. And each year, the corn failed and food had to be imported to the fort. Starlight grew and began to walk, with Kaiba helping her. Shortly before the Navajos were set free, Sani married a boy, Aiden, whom she met in the fort. On the way home, High Jumper and Serenita came to an understanding. Once they found good, fertile land, they would marry and build their own hogan near her parents' hogan. Partridge Girl, Grandfather, Grandmother, the two aunts, and Starlight went back to the Canyon de Chez. But Serenita made a promise that each year in the month of the parting of the seasons, October, she would come to visit them in Sei. Only Sani disappeared from her life, going farther west with Aiden and his family. Kaiba settled down near her sister and raised her own family when she was old enough to marry. Silvercoat lived for many years with Serenita and High Jumper, breeding with other herd dogs and always producing the swiftest, bravest, and most gentle pups. Serenita and High Jumper had four children, one of them being named Sani after her friend. This Sani had her own children and a daughter she called Serenita, who was sent to the white man's school to be educated as the Navajos had promised in their final treaty with the U.S. government. The end.